king of MS and I became the queen of ALS in Montreal. So good things happen to those who work very hard. Um, so I will speak today really about clinical trials and your opportunities and your risks and why it's so important. And certainly right now we are in a stage where we feel like MS is solved, although I'm sure you don't. But for people in clinical research, we've watched the success of the therapies in multiple sclerosis and from where I sit, we envy uh, people like you because you actually now have choices. When, we fir when I first started with Dr. Francis, probably my first or second study with him, I think I had one before that, was the first studies on uh, beta serum, uh, the interferons, and the excitement when the results came out was overwhelming. And to think how far we've come from the interferons and now we're, I believe, ocrelizumab is actually approved and how many things you currently have options with. And most importantly, not only is the MS world focusing on relapsing remitting MS, but I believe you heard from Dr. Arnold earlier and we now are starting to find therapies for primary progressive MS, and that is huge. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, what it means to participate, and hopefully I can come back in five or ten years and tell you that ALS and Alzheimer's have caught up to you, and that would be truly exciting for me. So what does it mean to take part in clinical research? Clinical research simply means that the work that people have been doing in their labs, uh, basic research, has come, has given us clues and has led to the development of therapies that are ready to be tried in people, patients specifically. Before uh, trials can get this far, the, the first drugs tried in patients, we have to test these drugs in other systems. So what we call that is preclinical toxicity studies. So no drug is ever offered to a patient before it's been tried in models that reflect the disease the patient has. So there is a model that we use for multiple sclerosis. And there, um, the models have to do well. So that it has to be safe in those models. And not only does it have to be safe, but it has to give us a clue that it's going to be beneficial before it gets to patients. Sometimes, in between the preclinical models and patients like you, are normal, healthy people. Sometimes they're not. In ALS trials and in cancer trials, often the normal control trial is not done or is done in a very small way because we're in such a hurry to find treatments for these devastating diseases. But the reason for trials is to prove either a drug is effective or not, to prove that it's safe, and then ultimately to prove that you can use it for a long time. Always the people who participate in clinical trials volunteer to participate. One of the most important things about that word is that people should never feel that they have to participate in a trial or else their doctor won't take care of them anymore. So it's, that's called coercion if a doctor, if it's obligatory to, apply, to take part in a clinical trial. So the volunteer part is really important and also not only does the volunteer part to start in a clinical trial, but if for some reason you cannot continue, you're always allowed to withdraw from a clinical trial. So you're never forced in and you're never forced to continue. That's what voluntary participation means. And the objective of, volunteer, of, of clinical trials is to find better ways to treat, diagnose, and understand the disease that we're looking at. Clinical trials can be sponsored by many groups. You in multiple sclerosis are used to big pharmaceutical companies because 
of the length of time we've been able to develop drugs for multiple sclerosis. What you should remember is Big Pharma now was, weren't always Big Pharma. One of the companies many of you may have heard about, Biogen, started out as a one drug company many years ago. So Big Pharma comes from Small Pharma comes from really Small Pharma, what we call biotech. Trials can also be sponsored by individual physicians. They can be sponsored by foundations and charities. They can be sponsored by angel investors and other types of investors. And they can actually also be sponsored by medical institutions. So they're not just pharma driven. Sometimes they're driven by other organizations that have found a product or a therapy that doesn't have a patent, is generic, yet may be helpful to a disease. We're about to start one just like that in, um, in ALS uh, at our institution. So a drug that's been on the market for 40 years may help in ALS. So there are four different phases. When we talk about trials, first there's clinical trials, which means that their patients are involved and they're the word drug trials mean that patients are involved and the purpose of the clinical trial is to test a drug in a population of patients. There are four different phases and the reason for the four phases is you can't jump to a, tr a full treatment trial until you've proven that the drug is safe and that you have the right dose of whatever drug or product you're giving. So phase one is the safety. It's the very first phase. It's what, when we give the drug for the first time with pa to patients with multiple sclerosis, say, or ALS. The point of this is to see that the drug is safe, that what kind of side effects the drug gives, because it can be safe but give a lot of side effects, common in cancer drugs. And also it's the beginning of finding out what the best dose is. Usually phase one trials are under 100 patients. Sometimes phase one trials are 15 patients, no more than 15 patients. Phase two trials are where we really look hard to find out the right dose. So we've figured out that it's safe or relatively safe, as safe as we can with the data we have. And we're still looking for side effects, but what we're really looking for in phase two is to figure out whether the dose is, say, 100 milligrams, 300 milligrams, 600 milligrams, or in some intravenous uh, therapies, whether we should be giving it every week, every two weeks, every month. These are the kind of things we sort out in phase two. Often with phase two trials, we try to do a lot of extra tests. I don't know what Dr. Arnold talked about this morning, but in, say, Alzheimer's trials, we're in the middle of some really important trials in Alzheimer's disease now. Uh, paradigm shifting trials, like big changes. So in this, these trials, we're now doing not only blood tests and, and uh, clinical assessments, we're doing PET scans, we're doing lumbar punctures, we're doing special MRIs, and that's what comes in in phase two, sometimes phase one, but really in phase two, to help us be sure that what we think we're seeing is what we're actually seeing. So in the Alzheimer's studies, we're looking to see if we can get rid of this bad protein called amyloid that's so important in Alzheimer's disease. Phase two leads to phase three. In some rare diseases, and the rarest disease that affects your community is NMO, neuromyelitis optica. And neuromyelitis optica would fall under this, what I'm about to speak about, which is if the disease is rare enough, it's considered an orphan disease. So the phase two trial can be rolled into the phase three trial, which means you have, you can, um, people see it as skipping a step. But what you're really doing is combining two steps to try to get to the answer more quickly. Because in rare diseases, you don't have the same numbers of patients uh, to be able to do the gigantic uh, studies. 
So after phase two comes phase three. Now these are the studies that make the big difference. This is what was announced on about ocrelizumab last year that came out in one of the big meetings. This is the studies when they're positive, it means the companies are taking the drug to the FDA or Health Canada for approval. What's important about phase three studies is that they're big. They're usually in multiple centers, in multiple sclerosis in Montreal. Um, usually you'll get the SHUM, the MUHC, NeuroReef, SUD, and possibly even um, then outside of Montreal, you'll get both Quebec City and Hull all involved in these phase three trials. So phase three means that we're testing it to really know if it works. So we've figured out most of the side effects, as many as we can. We have figured out what we think is the best dose. We're pretty sure it's doing what, we're th what we think it's doing in terms of all the special tests like PET or blood tests or CSF. So the numbers are big to prove that there's a difference between whatever is standard of care and this new drug. Some of these phase threes are placebo controlled, so the standard of care is nothing. In MS, that's harder and harder to do, as you know. It's still done in diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS because those diseases, we don't really have effective therapies. If you get a positive phase three trial, you can expect one of two things. If it's profoundly pro positive, like major news positive, like came out in a disease of babies called spinal muscular atrophy recently, then the study can actually be stopped early and the drug, all the babies were put on the drug and the drug is taken to the FDA for approval. That happens after phase three studies. But you're often looking at, in, in MS, you're looking at 1,000 patients. In rare diseases, you're still looking at 100. So you're looking at numbers. People try to get the best combination of patients to really prove does this drug work or not. Once you get positive phase three trials, one or two, depending on how positive, how good the effect, that's when the, uh, when the drug and all the information collected from all of the first three phases is sent to Health Canada, FDA, EMA for approval. So that's where the money is. That's where they get the approval. And then after approval, in Canada, there's one or two more steps, because that's the way it is. Um, so you, after approval, you can pay for the drug yourself, of course, or you, if your insurance company picks up the drug right away, the insurance company will pay for it. However, most often in Canada, it needs to go on the provincial formularies. And Quebec has its, uh, its um, provincial formulary uh, committee, and the rest of Canada has a separate, separate committee. In Canada, it's called the Common Drug Review. In Quebec now, it's, I think it's really connected with the INES program, but they both review the drug and decide if the benefit of the drug is enough to put it on the provincial formulary. Why does that matter? Because once it's on the provincial formulary, then hospitals can pick it up, then insurance companies cover it, then RAMQ can cover it, so it becomes accessible to everyone with the condition once it hits the provincial formulary. And then phase four trials are after a drug is approved, what happens long term? And that's where you get the information that comes up, up after many years of, uh, of trying a drug, things that surprise you, good and bad, from, the, from a drug. So some, as I mentioned, some trials compare new therapies to existing therapies. That's pretty common now in relapsing remitting MS. In other studies, it's, it's comparing new therapies to placebos. That's what you're going to see in primary progressive trials. Randomization means we don't know whether you're getting the active drug or the placebo. 
or the active drug or, or the current therapy, that's the way we determine whether or not the drug is effective because science has suggested that if people know what they're on, it affects the outcome. So it's not truly uh, tested properly in the scientific method if, people, if it's not random. Each study has unique eligibility criteria. They're called the inclusion-exclusion criteria. Inclusion means what you have to have to get into the study, and exclusion simply means if you have it, you can't get in the study. So sometimes that means if you have heart disease that's not stable, if you have a cancer, you can't get into a study. However, most of the time, we know that before we even talk to you about the trial. We have a, a good sense of what, we, what uh, the study is looking for, and so people, we try to talk to people about studies that only they are eligible in. There are other criteria. Age is sometimes a factor. Gender is rarely a factor. A stage of disease and cancer is a big deal. Previous treatment history is very important in multiple sclerosis because there are certain treatments that once you try them, you are no longer, longer eligible for any clinical trials. It's also important in ALS. If people go off and get random stem cell therapies in ALS, they're no longer eligible for clinical trials. There are a few other conditions, but those are the, those are the biggest e issues. Why should you participate? So I run a clinical research unit, and certainly I run an ALS clinic. So the benefits to participating when you have a disease like uh, Lou Gehrig's disease clearly, in my mind, outweigh any risk, especially because you only uh, participate if you're if you volunteer and you're allowed to drop out of a study at any time. You certainly gain access to treatments years before anyone else in your community can gain access. So you can hear about a great drug coming, but if you're not in the clinical trial, you can assume that that drug will not be available to you for two to three years after it's in the clinical trial. So there's a big gap, and it rarely gets shortened. You get very careful medical attention. You get a whole second team of uh, um, healthcare professionals. On top of your regular uh, doctor and your regular nurse, you get the entire research team. You certainly help others, and you certainly are playing a very active role in your health care. What are the potential risks? There's always a risk of a side effect, um, and a side effect that we don't know about. One thing about approved drugs is there are often side effects that are life-threatening, even with approved drugs, but we know about those side effects. So the difference is it may not yet be known. There are definitely more blood tests and more visits when you're in a clinical trial. Very few clinical trials do not have visits uh, any more than once every six months or once every year. They're usually once every uh, three months in, in two to three months in most studies with MS patients. Questions to ask? There are lots of questions you can ask. I think it's important for you to understand why the study, what uh, why, does the do why do the researchers and the doctor who's offering it to you think it may help you? You can certainly ask who funds the study. How long the study will last may be very important to you. And what are your responsibilities in terms of showing up to clinic, blood tests, anything like that? Participation in, in the study, you should think of, you can ask about what kind of therapies you're allowed in addition to the study medication. You can ask about what happens to your regular medications in the clinical trial. And a question that sometimes uh, becomes blurred for patients, you can ask who's in charge of your medical care. And simply put, your doctor is always in charge. The the role of the doctor running the clinical trial, which may or may not be your physician, um, that, the role of that person is solely around the conduct of the study and the study drug. You should expect 
that you will meet your doctor, your health care professional, and the team to answer any questions. You'll get an informed consent. You will be, have physical examinations done. You will be seen by the, the team regularly. And at the end of the clinical trial, you will find out what you were on. So for you to get involved, please contact your physician and ask about current and upcoming trials. This is just a diagram of the clinical research unit at the Neuro, and there are a lot of people involved. The person who you're most connected with is your study coordinator. We've been around since 86. We have a lot of things going on. We're at 110 trials right now, and we're involved in submitting results to Health Canada, the FDA, and the EMA. And we're de dedicated to taking care of people like you. So we're no different than Dr. Francis was in 1986 when he really started the neuro on the way to running clinical trials in multiple sclerosis. We have a couple uh, recruiting trials. I'm going to mention them super fast because it's time for questions. Those are CORDS and OBO. These are ocreluzumab trials. We have two more ocreluzumab trials coming one in SPMS and one in PPMS. We also have the MedDay and um, a combination therapy from Novartis and another study from Roche. And with that, I will take questions.